back. We're live. Oh, it's given Monday. We have Nicholas Sussman from Bogota, uh, Colombia, to talk to us. He's a consult legal consultant, a lawyer for a project Expedite Justice, uh, which is based here in Honolulu. And that's uh, a very interesting discussion. In the way of um, uh, remarks to introduce this, you know, we've been talking to Carlos Juarez, and, and he's a uh, He's an international relations uh, teacher at the University of the Americas in uh, Puebla, Mexico. And he's painted a picture of Mexico for us over the past few years. So we know a little about Mexico, but in general, I think Americans don't know too much about what goes south of the border, what is happening in uh, Central America, South America, so forth. So it's a real treat to be able to talk to Nicholas about this. Um, and to talk about uh, human rights issues in Colombia. You know, we all came away with the notion that Colombia was rife with drugs and cartels and, and all the early violence and what have you. And, and it, indeed, it's been through a, a difficult history. But today, we're going to learn much more about it. We're going to learn about its relevance to not only, you know, the rest of the Americas, but also what we can learn from it in terms of its successes. So Nicholas, welcome to the show. So nice to have you here. Thank you, Jay. Uh, very happy to be with you. Uh, my greetings to the audience as well. Ah, good. So you have been around. You have um, you have studied law. Uh, you have uh, lived and worked in uh, in in uh, the EU, and um, you speak. Uh, I was counting them before. I think I heard four languages: Spanish, English. French, and German, German, three languages. Three, forget French. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need French because you were in <laughs> Amsterdam. <laughs> anyway, so and now you're uh, with uh, associated with Project Expedited Justice, which is very important. And wherever they go, there's a problem. Um, when I read up on this a little bit today, I, I found that uh, since 2005, uh, Colombia has been doing better than its violent uh, and corrupt past. But uh, I wonder if you can bring us current on how it's doing these days and why Project Expedite Justice is interested in Colombia these days. Right, Jay. So what, what you say is true. Uh, since early 2000s, there's been a lot of peace attempts. We've experienced uh, an armed conflict since at least the 1950s. But if you, if you count, you can take our history of violence, sadly, way, way back, uh, even to our, our colonial past. Uh, but, but since 2005, with the strengthening of, of institutions of the government, also since the 1990s, with a new constitution that has a very strong um, Bill of Rights, and, and we have approached the, the issue of peace and developed a series of peace process with the different armed groups uh, in our country. The, the most relevant one was the one that, that we conducted and, and signed by 2016 with the, the FARC, which was the, the biggest guerrilla at the time, who, as you said, uh, had some issues with drug dealing to finance itself and also was a sort of side business. Uh, but it has been really good since then. Uh, we signed a peace agreement. Uh, the majority of the forces demobilized and they are trying to comply. So we are in the challenge of implementation, but things are getting better and leaving the conflict aside, we could also focus in, in, in other issues as well. Uh, nevertheless, not, not, not everything is happy. And I must also be honest with the audience and tell that we have serious human rights issues that require the attention of the government and the support of the international community. The first one is the implementation of the process. And the second one, the challenges that come with that, uh, such as the killing of social leaders and uh, former combatants who are trying to to reintegrate into society, but are being killed by uh, what some people believe are far-right paramilitary groups that do not support the process or do, that are uh, seeing their privileges uh, threatened because of the peace process, because there's an uh, economic underlying component to, to the origins of conflict and therefore to the solutions of the peace agreement, mainly with the land. Well, uh, looking back at that peace agreement, I remember how important that was. Uh, it was the end of a period of uh, violence and disruption and, and uh, fragmentation of the country. Um, you know, and maybe that's part of the, the fact that um, you have multiple cultures, you have multiple languages, 
you have 60 some odd languages in Colombia. It's not just Spanish. It's uh, it's, it's and and that's and that's probably because it's at the at the neck um, of Central America. There, uh, looking north uh, into Panama, looking east into Venezuela, and so forth. There's a lot of you have a lot of contiguous countries around you. A lot of what do you say border issues uh, from way back when, and uh, I guess that does create a difficult environment. And so it, you know, the country had uh, violence uh, from after the World War II that that was ubiquitous. Um, it was the period was called la, la violence because there was violence everywhere for a long time. Um, and so all of a sudden we have a, an agreement and we have a, an enlightenment in Colombia. Who was responsible for that? Why did that happen? What, you know, what were the forces that brought all those warring factions together? Well, you have several issues going on. As I, as I was saying, this builds up uh, for, for a long time. Uh, first, it comes with the change in the constitution. I would say we had uh, before the one we have nowadays that was approved in 1991. Uh, a very conservative institution focused in the central state uh, that was excluent of, of diversity, of different groups, of acknowledging uh, different uh, cultures, origins, and so on. In 1991, you get a new constitution with a wide bill of rights that opens to diversity, that understands the existence of indigenous peoples, of black people, that uh, looks for, for um, representation and that is also thinking in the peace of the country. And, and it's very interesting because it even uh, states the human right to peace, that I would say that is something very, very interesting and very different that responds to our needs. So, so when they drafted, they were thinking in that. And that provides uh, for a legal structure that allow the government to do that. Then uh, during the 1990s, uh, you have a very hard time with drug dealing and the, the other type of violence. Uh, and you need uh, to, th th there comes a, a military response, a strength that strengthens the government. Uh, there, we must say that the US played an important part providing us with support. And that allows the government in some sort, some way to meet forces with the rebel groups. We must, we must accept that the rebel groups at some time were, were more or less winning uh, the battle. But then in the 1990s and the 2000s, you have a military offensive that allows the government to start winning the battle. But then you come to a point where no one's winning because our geography is complicated. We have jungles, we have mountains. So actually exercising control over the land is very hard. And, and the rebel groups go there and hide there. So it's very difficult to exercise governmental authority. Uh, so then um, after I would say 2010, we get a new president. He was a brilliant uh, secretary of defense for the, for the former government. Uh, he was elected and endorsed by that, that government. And, and he decides that that is the moment for peace. So he starts uh, trying to talk with the rebel leaders. They do some conversations uh, that were concealed for, from the population to explore the agenda. And he gathers a lot of expertise, both national and international, and decides to conduct uh, peace, at, peace talks with a defined agenda that actually aims for the root causes of the conflict and tries to, to establish a plan to, to solve them. It was only with the biggest group, but but it's it's a roadmap that that you could follow to to achieve peace. Uh, so that is how you come there. It was a very long uh, peace talks. You could say like three, four years, and then in 2016 you sign it. Um, we have a vote to see if we approve it, uh, and 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 those who were in favor lost the vote, which is very very surprising for for a lot of people, and and they they lost it just for one percent. Uh, so that was very, very surprising because you have a, a group ready to disarm itself. You have several years of conversations and then the population does not agree with the, with the peace process of what are you gonna do? So they had to renegotiate some points taking into consideration the opposition and now we're in the phase of implementation. Uh, so, th so that is it's how, been how signed. you come. It's, it's, a, it's a fait accompli now, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, we're implementing it, but you're sign you, you signed it already. Okay, so why did they oppose it? I mean, what was the problem that they saw? Well, why why would they take those steps in the face of what appeared to be a very good deal? 
Well, uh, there's a lot of issues going on. The first one is that there's a very strong uh, sense of, of rejection to the former rebel group. Uh, if you ask any Colombian, uh, in some way they were affected by the conflict, either because they were directly victims of the conflict or because they had to adjust their lifestyle uh, to the dynamics of conflict. And that takes a toll on how you see this, these things. Uh, and for some people, uh, mostly in the in the cities, uh, getting the transitional justice process where you get lenient penalties for these people who who committed the, the worst crimes was a, a, an ordeal. They they thought that they just should just go to jail and pay for what they did and and pay pay, pay harshly for it. Uh, coming with that, uh, we must accept that there was a lot of fake news uh, from parties that opposed to the agreement and that also took a toll on the approval of the agreement and fake news came from, from different sectors and aiming to different interests. For example, you had uh, them saying that uh, elder people who were getting the retirement fund would be, would be uh, damaged by the process because the funds from the retirement funds would go to finance the process. That, that was not, not true, but that, that makes you get scared and, and vote against it. Uh, also, we are a very conservative Catholic country and, and there were discussions about the inclusion of, of sexual diversity issues in the, in the school plan and things like that, which, that were not true. But in, in, in the midst of this information, uh, people start doubting that that was one part because what, what, why they, they oppose it. And I think those who, who, who agreed with the process took it for granted and didn't vote as much as they should have uh, because the polls even nowadays say that it has a, a significant uh, amount of approval, the majority approval. But when, when you get the vote and they didn't vote, then, then they lost, not only, but they lost. So what, what are things like in Colombia now? I mean, I'm specifically thinking about the uh, continuing existence of the cartel, of, of drugs, of, of violence, of corruption. Uh, have, have you put all that behind you? Uh, are you clear of that? And uh, what about that new constitution? Do you have a First Amendment where you can speak to me freely? Um, is there any threat to you? Um, how do you feel about living there? No, I feel very safe. And I've, I've always felt very safe living here. Um, this, this conflict is not a conflict that always hits you in the city. Actually, if you're in the cities, you're very safe. It is a conflict that, that happens in the countryside. And, and takes a lot of, of damage on, on the people who live in the countryside and far from the city. So always it, it's been very safe, even in the worst times of the conflict and now even more. Uh, regarding uh, the liberties and civil liberties, uh, you can exercise them very much. As I told you, we have a very wide bill of rights, a very good constitution and a very good legal structure to defend that constitution. Uh, we have good courts, independent courts, strong courts that have defended it. Uh, the governments, even the ones that are more restrictive, understand that there is a limit in the constitution and we have a very active civil society that does not fear going to the streets uh, to defend their rights when, when they, have, they have issues. But you can pretty much say whatever you want and, and there's no problem and express your, your opinions. Where, where you have problems, as I say, is in the countryside, uh, not everywhere, but in the countryside where the state is not present, where there are a lot of armed groups fighting for the land, uh, there you will have a problem. There you will have a problem, but not only speaking, but trying to exercise your human rights uh, overall, because these groups take advantage of, of the state absence to, to push their interests and violate the human rights of other people to obtain profit from, from violence. Let's, let's go to that. Um, <clears throat> your, um, a lawyer and you're associated with uh, Project Expedite uh, Justice, which operates in a variety of continents. I'm happy to hear that, uh, you know, it has a presence and is, is uh, doing positive things in Colombia. But um, what, what are the problems that you address uh, as a member uh, associated with a group that is interested in, um, in human rights and war crimes and the like? Um, what, what is happening that you need to, to address? Right, Jay, so, so there first I should make a correction. We currently, as Project Expedited Justice, do not work in Colombia, but there are a whole other group of, of NGOs that are doing it, both national and international, and I can speak a bit about that because they're very important and they do a lot of good work here. 
Uh, so the things that they are addressing are the most pressing matters, such as the killing of social leaders that I just mentioned. I think that is one of the most urgent matters or some issues uh, of, of excessive use of force by, by police and corruption issues or, or trying to go against legislation that can be a bit restri restrictive. The, the, that is one part of what they do. Uh, the other part that is going on are the, the grassroots uh, organizations in the regions that are trying to get control again over the land. They were dispossessed of, that they were driven out by violence and they're trying to go back and set up institutionality to teach people about their human rights, to create social co uh, cohesion so the community itself can protect themselves from violence. And there are very interesting case studies about that. that there's a, a town called uh, San Jose de Apartado. It's, their, their project is not new. They're doing it at least, I believe, since the 1980s, but they decided they would, that they would remain neutral in the conflict. And they're in, right in the middle of one of the most violent zones in Colombia. Mm -hmm. And then decided that they are not going to accept conflict or violence in their region. And they declared their city as a neutral zone. And they drove out all of the, of, of the armed actors, not with violence, just stating that they would not accept that and opposing even the army the government from being there because they understand that the government brings some sort of violence. Uh, so that is a very important thing that is also going on. And, and we should pay attention and, and the other countries should pay attention to those grassroots groups because they're most more vulnerable to violence because they don't have outreach, they don't have a platform. So, so them, they should be protected, uh, but the, the international community has paid attention to that and, and that is very important and good. That's really very interesting. When you say the international community, what what do you mean? I mean, is this from Europe, from Asia, from the U.S.? Uh, who is paying attention? Well, I think we have a very strong uh, support from from the U.S. way back uh, through through the state itself, from USAID, from the Secretary of State. They, they have always supported Colombia as, as we've been strong allies in the region. But with the peace agreement, the EU has been very important. And uh, they have financed uh, parts of the process. They have gone to the communities. The ambassadors go and speak to, with the social leaders. Even when they are threatened, they go on public uh, with the social leaders stating like this man or these women should be protected and, and so on. And that is very important, you know, Jay, uh, because as I told uh, the government, these governments in particular is not supportive of the peace agreement. It does not believe that the peace agreement should be done as it was done. Uh, so the implementation can be challenged, but when the international community is behind, is supporting it, is calling for the implementation, uh, they have a harder time not doing what they have to do. Also the International Criminal Court is, is supporting Colombia. They have examined our situation for, for a very long time to see if we, if we can do it right or we cannot. So far we have done it, but without their support, it would be, more difficult for the opposers of the peace process not to implement it and, and so on. One thing you mentioned I wanna, I wanna just dwell on for a moment uh, uh, is, is the, uh, the notion that there is a right-wing movement in Colombia. Can you describe what that is and how it plays into these processes you're talking about? Yeah, of course. Uh, so we think similar to, to the things that we see uh, in many places of the world now, nowadays, even in the US, we have a deeply divided society. Uh, and our division in this case came from the peace process, but, but, but even from, from, from way behind. And, and you could draw these distinctions between the left, the center and, and the right, you know? Uh, and the right was against uh, of the peace process because they considered it as impunity. They believe in a notion of order and security through the use of force. Right? They believe in strong justice, strong criminal justice with strong penalties in the military defeat of the armed groups and, and so on. And those were the people behind uh, the, the opposition to the peace process. And the, they are the ones who, who take care of the government nowadays. We have uh, some leftist groups, and they're very diverse. They, they, they go from, from any possible position, from democratic liberals with a left tendency to, to very far right people. Uh, but you, you can see the division and, and the conversations in, in Colombia are held between the right and the left. And, and our last elections have been, have been that way. And that is not productive to, to advance an implementation of the peace process, to leave behind corruption, 
uh, to actually look for the best candidate for the problems of the country because people tend to identify themselves with one of the two positions uh, without going beyond in their proposals. And also um, with this division, people get very afraid from the other side, you know? Also the ones in the right are afraid that if a leftist or left-handed candidate wins, then they're going to take their property away and increase taxes and all of that. And, and on the other side, um, the, the, the right-wing people believe that, that a right-wing government is gonna take over the institution and is gonna eliminate the courts and so on. But, but all, the, all what it's in the center, even moderate positions are, become invisible. And I believe those, those positions are very important to, to achieve consensus, to push the country forward, to achieve unity, to, to, and to move on with, with the life of the country, to, to make it better for everyone, which I believe is, is the objective. Yeah, and so how are you doing in that objective? I mean, are you optimistic, uh, Nicholas? Are you optimistic about the future? Is, is this the thing where uh, Colombia is doing better every time you look? Or is it, is it under stress, uh, sort of the way the US is? Um, how do you feel about the future in Colombia for the country, uh, for the various factions and for yourself? Uh, I feel optimistic, Jay. Uh, sadly, not because of the government necessarily, as I tell you, they have very, very strong positions in some aspects that take a toll on human rights and that's what I care for. Uh, and that take a toll on the peace process and that will lead to violence at, as it is growing more and more and more every time they don't implement as they should the peace process. But I am optimistic because we have strong institutions, we have strong courts and we can rely on the courts uh, to save that, that part of the country. And I trust in the Colombian society as well. We are a pushing society, a vibrant society, a society that when it has come uh, the moment to make decisions to request rights, to mobilize, we have done it. And, and that I can trust with a vibrant civil society and strong institutions. It does not matter how, how the government is being handled because you can, you can uh, counterbalance the, those policies coming from where they come, not right, not left. You could just try to focus on the people if you have institutions and society to care for that. It sounds like there are a lot of people that feel the way you do. In other words, uh, what the, the idea I get from this discussion is that a lot of people in, in Bogota and also in, in Colombia in general are, uh, um, they're, they're engaged with the country. Uh, they care about the country. They're um, educated about the country. Um, and they're, you know, uh, part of the, what do you want to call it? The national fabric. They're not complacent. Am I right? Yeah, that is right. That is right. Well, everything is very is very varied, but yes, you have that a lot of people that, that care for that right now, and they're trying to work for that, and that go outside and study and try to come back. Uh, now it is the time for new politics to to come in, and and for new public servants to come in to change a bit the culture. And I think that's also one thing that the peace process allowed you to do because before you were either with the rebels or against the rebels and no one was gonna be against the rebel, uh, for the rebels, you know? Everyone wanted to be against the rebels. But once you take out that big enemy, you can start focusing on the other problems of the country, such as inequality, corruption, uh, mismanagement of government funds and things like that. And, and that is very good and very important. There's a lot of people wanting to work on that. I think that's one of the biggest advantages of the peace process. Not only no more violence were not in that scale, but also drawing our attention to other very important problems that maybe were the causes of, of violence. Yeah. So here we're at that time of our discussion, Nicholas, where I want to ask you, um, you know, you follow, of course, what's happening in the U.S., I'm sure everybody in the world follows. I mean, you have good broadband. I'm sure you get lots of news from the U.S. <laughs> and, and I suppose there's a substantial American community in, in Bogota also, uh, you know, who talk about this. So my question to you is, you know, you've been through a hard time. Sounds like you've, you've learned a lot. You, meaning the country, learned a lot. The, uh, you know, the literati and the people in general um, you know, have, have, have found a, a good way to deal with these problems and they are basically succeeding. And the question I put to you is, 
You know, what can the United States learn? You're aware of the difficulties we've had. You're aware of the Trump administration and what he has done and not done. You're aware of certainly of, of COVID and our economic problems and our divisiveness. It's a, it's a sad story in the past few years. And, and I can see that you look north, you look to the US and you, and you have what one Irish, wrote, Irish reporter said was a, a kind of pity to the giant who used to be a giant and isn't so much a giant anymore. Um, and query, what, what lessons uh, have you learned that you could offer to the United States? Oh, right, right, Jay. So yeah, I see a lot of resemblances uh, in the situation that we experience nowadays and that we experienced before and what you have in the US. Uh, you have long-standing conflicts and issues that you should address. I think that's the first recommendation. You cannot move on without having accountability and without acknowledging the people that has been harmed. That's the first thing. And you have to acknowledge that the institutions played a role in that. Uh, because groups take control of the institutions to push their interests, is it's just natural. So you need to address that at first and you need to sit down with the affected communities and listen to them and construct a process that acknowledges to that. Uh, you need to acknowledge the phenomena. You go, need to go deep down into the roots of the, of the problem and listen to them and let them speak because they have been silent for I don't know, a hundred years or more even. So you need to listen to them and see what they have to say and how they want to solve this. That's the first one. The second one is that you need to be open to hear all sides of the story, even the radicals. And hearing to them does not mean that you need to tell them that they are right and that that's not the terms of the conversation, but you need to take their claims seriously because radicals have the capacity of convincing moderates that things are much worse than they actually are. And I think that was the problem that we had with the vote in the, in the peace agreement. And the ones who were in favor of the agreement thought that it was granted and that being against the agreement was just nonsense. And it's not like that. There are people that have concerns about this. There are people that have lived all their lives in a certain way and now things change and they are uh, truly afraid of change or truly afraid of some communities based on, on prejudice, but still their, their fear is real. So you need to listen to all sides and to bring all concerns together and focus in the moderates uh, to construct consensus around that. If you exclude them, even uh, if, if, if those excluded can be radical or, or can say a bit of controversial uh, statements, you are not moving together as a society. You need to listen to them to reconcile first and also because they are fellow citizens that need to be included in the kind of country you need. Uh, and the final thing is keep strong institutions. That's the most important thing. I think that what we can learn from the US last week, and, and I think my colleague said it uh, the last time you spoke to him, is that democracy is fragile, but also democracy has a lot of tools to protect itself. So defend the courts, and uh, allow grassroots movements and the civil society to be, to be vibrant and move the society. And I think the US has a lot of potential for that. Uh, only seeing what happened in Georgia is, is a good example of what you can achieve. And uh, now you need to engage with the communities to move forward. Uh, if you dad do that, I think you can, you can move forward as society uh, and you can mend a lot of mistakes from the past. I, I, I don't think that, that what happened on, on the beginning of this year was the result of four years of, of American history. I think there was a lot of things uh, moving from, from behind and they just exploded in some way. And, uh, and some people were allowed to, to, to bring that violence until that point because no one stopped them before. So now it is the time to, to reconcile and to see what is going on there to avoid those things from happening again. again. That, that would be my suggestion. Yeah, but uh, who is that suggestion addressed to? I mean, are, uh, you've mentioned that government may not be as important as we think uh, in, in, in working these problems out. What is the role of government? And how do you reach people and change? I'm talking about in the United States now. How do you reach people and, and, and show them uh, to listen, show them to try to reach consensus? Um, you know, you have um, at least 70 million people who, um, you know, would, would like nothing more than a good fight. Uh, so how do you change the way they think and the way they see it? And what, how do you bring in government when there's a lot of people in this country who have no confidence in government? 
But I think precisely the role of the government is not that it is not important, but it should change the way in which it traditionally behaves. Usually the government dictates what should be done and how things are, uh, even to the point where you had a president that wanted even to shape reality through government. Uh, I think the government should change that approach and be a government that listens and that acknowledges what it has done. Uh, I think one of the best ways to solve issues, and, and this is not only happening at the government level, but in, in personal level, is that when you're in a fight with someone and you have been in, in bad terms with that, people, that person for some time, and then someone comes up and says like, you know, I did wrong, I did it because of these reasons, and I apologize. Then the other side is confident and comes and says, okay, let's work things together and see can we can solve it. I think that government can do that. And that is the only way to, to find trust in the communities that are distrustful of the government, because we have to accept that minorities uh, see the government as an enemy, not, not as someone that takes care for them. So I think that is the first point. The government should acknowledge and approach them and, and, and take the best step. Like, you know, there are things that go wrong. We know that institutions have played a big role in this. And now let's open a conversation to dialogue about this. And I think grassroots movements are organized. They have their leaders. They know exactly what has been wrong. They have in mind what reforms are needed. Uh, and, and that could be a very good starting point if government listens and try to convey all voices uh, from that part. That doesn't mean giving uh, leeway to everyone to do whatever they want, but the government can be a moderator of that conversation starting from the acceptance of its own responsibility in what's going on. You mentioned that uh, uh, Colombia has had issues around fake news in the past, and, and surely we uh, have experienced that, and we still are. There are people who um, get fake news and act on it uh, and believe it to the core of their existence. And I suppose part of what your what you, your experience in the country and your advice to the, this country is that we have to we have to exercise fake news. We we have to agree on the facts, um, but how do you do that when there are so many, I don't wanna call them institutions, I'll, I'll call them media or, or people who play the media uh, who would love nothing more than to spread fake news in order to advance their own interest. How do you solve that problem? How have you solved it in Colombia and how should the United States solve it? Well, there's a lot of issues going there and, and how to handle this is complicated because it goes right against freedom of expression, or at least it, it rises consensus, uh, like concerns about that, right? Because everyone in principle should be allowed to speak freely about what they believe. Uh, but again, we must remember that freedom of expression is not absolute and it comes with another right that is very important, that is the right to have information. People to act and to live in society need to have information and information needs to be real for people to make decision, right? And, and that, uh, that goes together with freedom of expression. And sometimes they go together, sometimes they are in tension. Uh, and I think the solutions should come from harmonizing those, those two things, right? Uh, so the first one is that big media have a responsibility on content um, control. Uh, the government controlling media and what is said and done, that's, that's not okay because today you have a president that believes in human rights and he's not gonna censor, but tomorrow you don't and you have the same power in, in the office, right? Uh, so we think there's a, a responsibility for media to control to control the content, that's first, uh, and see which voices they give uh, space to, right? Uh, you know, there nowadays, uh, the amount of views, likes, and so on that you have uh, create profit. And, and there's a business that medias are, they want profit, but they also have a responsibility on this access to information and they need to, to make the right choice every time to see who they give voices, uh, voice to, because they, if they get voice to someone that's gonna bring a lot of, of clicks and so on, but is gonna use their platform to disseminate bad ideas, well, you could end in another January 6th or, or even worse. So that's the first issue. The second one is empowering uh, different media outlets. The more content you have, the more views you have, uh, then the more resources people have to, to get information from different force, sources and, and have a, a, their own opinion. Uh, and the third one is, is to, to also help society to, to do this. So uh, you can do uh, fake news checking, you can do capacity building, you can do, uh, as a government, 
uh, interactive and, and, and didactic uh, programs, I don't know, uh, ads or, or, or things like that to identify fake news. The media already done has done it, but if it comes from the government level, not saying this is fake, this is true, but saying like, you know, these are the things you can use to avoid fake news, uh, look for the source, uh, look if it makes sense, look for the time, look for who it comes from, then that also there's a lot of, of citizen control in the media and as, an, as, an, as clients and content uh, consumers, they can also decide which media gets more space or not. I think that those could be ways to do it. And I think uh, this has been very important in Colombia because uh, alternative uh, media are getting, are getting strength and they provide really good information that counterbalances fake news. Good advice. And, but you know, it sounds like you've already talked to Joe Biden and you advised him accordingly and that he is taking your advice. I mean, how do you, <laughs> how do you think he's doing, Nicholas? Well, I think he's doing really good. I, I am impressed for, for about the, the executive orders he has signed. I think Biden was uh, chosen as candidate because he was a candidate that was safe for right-wing moderates that didn't want another Trump administration. Uh, but then he comes into office and, do, and does really uh, progressive things uh, in, in, in his first day. So I think it's good. I think those are things that are aligned with, with human rights and that is good. That is my standard for, for evaluating a government is not, not if I like it or not, but if it advances or not human rights, I may think he's doing it. Uh, so I think he has done good so far. We remain to see the implementation of these measures. We remain to see how society and other stakeholders are gonna react to it. Uh, and also there are still things to be done as addressing uh, the needs of, of minorities, or for example, removing and lifting the sanctions that were imposed on International Criminal Court. Um, the U.S. shouldn't be afraid of the International Criminal Court. Keeping the International Criminal Court at stake more, is more or less really easy for a government that is willing to comply with its obligation. And it's conducting investigations that the court otherwise would, would conduct. So if you don't want uh, foreign judges judging American citizens, judge them themselves, judge them yourself. And that, that's the solution. Uh, but so far, I think it's, it's been a really good government. He has been more progressive than you could have imagined. And we remain to see how, how this moves on. But, but his first days have been really, um, I don't know, they, they, allow, they, they bring some hope uh, to all faults that care about human rights. Ah, thank you, Nicholas. Nicholas Sussman, thank you very much uh, joining us from Bogota, Colombia. I hope we can get to talk again. I have many more questions for you. In the meantime, uh, have a happier new year and uh, stay safe. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you for having me and always glad to talk to you. Aloha.